Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Lorraine Proventure. I'm at the University of Michigan. And the title of this morning's webinar is What I Wish I Had Known for My 51st FACOS. And if I had a chance to really revise this title, I would change it to What I Wish I Had Understood for My 51st FACOS. I think a lot of the things I'm going to go over today are relatively basic and they are things I knew I had read about but really understanding them and grasping their importance is something that came much later. So I'm going to go step by step through lessons from my early surgical experience. We're going to basically start at the beginning of cataract surgery and go through time course and I'll highlight things I learned and I wish I had known a little earlier. Along the way, I will try and highlight useful simulation tools for the early FACO surgeon. And then also the ultimate goal is to improve patient safety here by bending the early surgical learning curve. So just to get to know you all and who all's out there, we're gonna start with a little poll question. I'd like to know how many FACO surgeries you all have performed. Have you performed none? Less than 50, 50 to 200? 200 to 500, or 500 to 1,000, or more than 1,000. Great, so it looks like the majority have performed either less than 50, maybe 50 to 200, or none at all. So this is great. Some of you are very experienced, however, and have done over 1,000. So we'll do another question here real quick. What step do you find most challenging with phaco surgery? Is it wound construction? capsulorexis, hydrodissection, nuclear disassembly, or cortex removal. And it looks like the vast majority of you find nuclear disassembly challenging about 60%, and then about a quarter say capsulorexis. So we'll go over some of that today. Again, what I wish I had understood for my 51st FACOs. And I think lesson one starts well before you even set foot, or really, sit down in the, the primary surgeon chair. I think learning can really start before you are even operating. So when you are assisting, don't just be an assistant. And this took a while for me to really appreciate. This is a photo of me from residency where it looks like I'm spacing out a little bit and staring at my attending's hair cap instead of really being engaged. And so I'd encourage you all to be very active assistance. And what I mean by that is you have a chance to turn down the brain input to your fingers and to your toes and when you're not operating and instead increase your learning by just being a good assistant. One advantage assisting has over watching surgical videos is you have the opportunity to see what the surgeon's hands are doing. So I'd encourage you to ask how they are doing what they're doing actually peek around the microscope, see how they're holding their hands. Because as when you're first starting out, things can feel really awkward and you don't even know what you're doing wrong to feel so awkward. So take a look at your attending's hand. One great piece of advice I also got is ask your primary surgeon that you're assisting to tell you what they're thinking. A lot of times we don't know what we don't know. And so to know what your attending is thinking in the moment is really crucial. So say, I wish I knew what you were thinking right now. Ask why. And then what? So think about if you were operating what you would be doing, what would be your next step? So staying constantly engaged as an assistant can set you up well when you become the primary surgeon. Lesson two would be anticipate, anticipate, anticipate. And so this is something we were really, really taught well in residency. And that's when you sit down to sign a patient up for surgery. Pre-op evaluation and patient selection are so crucial, especially when you're very junior and very early in your FACO training. What I like to envision is as you bring the patient in the room, how the case is going to go from beginning to the end. So what sort of anesthesia are they going to need? Are they going to be somebody that needs general anesthesia? Or are they somebody that's good for topical or maybe somewhere in between a retrobulbar block? Think about how you're going to position this patient. Look at their body habitus, ask about how they lie flat, and then also look at their orbit and how their eye exposure is going to be. Think about when you draw the microscope over and look at their dilation, their red reflex, how is your view going to be? 
And then also make sure you're asking about zonular or capsular issues. Um, have they had surgeries? Have they had trauma? Is their lens moving more than it should? And of course, you need to know their ocular history and their prior surgeries. The main goal of all of this, and no one really ever explicitly said this to me, but the goal is to figure out when and where something might go wrong. Usually, if you can anticipate it, you can avoid it. It's really when you're not anticipating something that you get surprised and things can go wrong. And the ultimate goal and ideal balance is to choose cases where the complexity is less than the surgeon's skill level. You want a better surgeon doing the case. It's better for patients. And when you're first starting, you need to set yourself up for success. So we'll do one more poll question here real quick. What step of cataract surgery, in your opinion, is most important? Is it wound construction, capsulorexis, hydrodissection, nuclear disassembly, or cortex removal? And it looks like the vast majority of you said capsulorexis followed by wound construction. I would disagree um, with everyone here, but I kind of agree with everyone, This um, the majority of you at the same time. So my argument is that every single step matters but the majority of you selected steps that are earlier in the case, which makes sense to me as well. So I like to think of cataract surgery as a, a building a house or building a pyramid. Every step matters and you gotta get the steps early on in the case right for a successful surgery. And so we're gonna go through the rest of this talk in sort of a stepwise fashion as we move up the pyramid and talk about things along the way on how you can build throughout the case and get everything right early on to set yourself up for success. We'll start with anesthesia, positioning, and exposure at the bottom of the pyramid. Positioning is, is something that I realized later on because early, early on I had great mentors and teachers that were doing all of this for me and I didn't realize it. There are things you can modify when it comes to positioning you can modify their chin position. You can't modify their brow, but there are ways to work around it. And then also don't forget that bed positioning can be really crucial. If you have a good modified or a dynamic bed, you can really use that to your advantage by putting the patient either in reverse Trendelenburg to maybe get over a prominent brow or Trendelenburg can be nice um, for patients that are kind of top heavy and you wanna reduce posterior pressure. Exposure is really crucial, and I'll go over a few examples of that, but you, the last thing you need to be worrying about are lashes in the way distracting you, maybe a accumulation of BSS distorting your view, and then you want to think about other things like retrobulbar block to increase proptosis. So this is a picture taken of a patient who's really draped really beautifully, great lash drapes. They've got the lid speculum in with the eye nice and wide open. Um, but what you'll notice is if you zoom in the superior limbus, there's hardly any access to the superior limbus. And so when you're doing FACO, you're often working with two hands and you really need to be able to get your second instrument in there superiorly where there's no view. It's hard to tell with the patient all draped, but this patient's actually a little chin down. And so when they're told to look straight ahead or to look up, they actually look like they're superducting a little bit. So if you tell the patient just to raise their chin, it makes a world of difference. And I think I tell patients multiple times a day during an OR day to bring their chin up. It's a really easy trick just to raise the chin. And then when they're looking straight ahead, you have better access to the superior globe. And I use this all the time and often multiple times throughout a case. So here's the same patient with their chin raised just a little bit and the exposure is far better. By the same fashion, you can tilt the bed backwards a little bit um, to, to expose the superior globe and to get the brow out of your way a little bit. This is something I didn't learn until fellowship, and I thought it was just so genius. But you get that pool of BSS during FACO, and it can really distort your view. And so if you have an instrument wipe, you can cut just a little strip off the side and stick it in the fornix. And even on topical cases, patients don't mind this at all. And it wecks away the fluid throughout the case. 
and um, can really help with your view. And this patient really probably needs to bring their chin up a little bit too, but this is a really great trick. And then finally for talking about exposure issues, I think you should always keep in mind the use and the utility of a retrobulbar block. Not only does it provide great akinesia and anesthesia for when you're first starting out, but it, if you get the block in the right spot, you can get really nice proptosis and better exposure. So we use this a lot when we are first training, but every now and then we'll still pull it out to use it on a planned topical case where exposure is just not great. Okay, we'll move a little further up the pyramid here. A paracentesis. So be very particular about your paracentesis. Just to review it, it's a one millimeter uniplanar radial wound, and you're going to be using it for injecting a lot of things like BSS, um, your, your medications, and your second instrument's going to be going in and out of this wound a lot, so you need it to be proper. Um, you can use blades, knives, or even a 25 gauge needle to make your paracentesis. And you'll see here, this is just a routine video of a routine para. Location is really important, and it depends on the type of second instrument you're going to be using. But generally, the second instrument should be positioned about 60 to 90 degrees away from the main wound. So here's an arrow showing 90 degrees. You can see that my para in relation to my main wound here is about 60 degrees. And what I do is at the start of the case is I kind of rest my hand where my main wound is going to go. And then I decide I kind of back calculate and put my para in relation to that. Because I will sometimes adjust where my main wound goes based on the patient's orbit, my exposure, and also if they have some astigmatism in that axis I want to address. And so if your para is too close or too far from your main wound, you can run into a lot of funny issues. You'll see in this video here that I'm getting some corneal distortion as I'm trying to crack the lens. I'm also having a lot of trouble rotating the lens more than usual, and I'm probably stressing the zonules more than necessary because of my poor para placement. And you'll see here again, I'm getting corneal distortion. And I finally just get fed up and realize what's going on. So I take my second instrument out. It takes like two seconds, make another para. You can barely see it there on the bottom of the screen. But it makes a world of difference. You can see how much easier it is for me to spin the lens here. And I've circled for you that I really only moved the para about one millimeter. And it made a huge, huge difference. So if your para is too close, or too far or even too long and you're feeling kind of or locked in your wound, the solution's simple. You just make another paracentesis. So we'll do one more poll question here real quick. What type of main wound do you use for your phacoemulsification? Are you using a pretty small clear corneal wound, a larger wound, a scleral tunnel, or a limbal wound? Right, it looks like the majority of you are using a clear corneal wound. And so this is really relevant here. We're going to talk about clear corneal wounds. So I learned early on there are a lot of ways to make mistakes when it comes to wound construction. But the ideal goal is to have a wound that's 3.5 millimeters or less and 2 millimeters in length. It has to be the right size for your phaco sleeve, though. So you need to understand that. And whatever phaco needle you're using, make sure you're using the right size wound. One concept that's really important to remember is you actually are creating the wound on the way in, but you can potentially create the wound on the way out as well. So you need to be paying attention as you remove the blade because there's an opportunity there if your hand slips or tilts to really mess up your wound. If your wound is too posterior, you can end up with a conjunctival donut. If it's too long or anterior, you can get corneal distortion, edema, and cloud your view. If it's too short. Let's see. Lawrence, I think my headphones died. Can you still hear me? Yep, we got you. Thank you, sorry. If your wound is too short, you're, um, you can get leaking at the end of the case, an iris prolapse, 
or if there's a tilt of your hand or a slide to the side on the way out, as I mentioned earlier, you can get leak or roof issues. And so we'll go over some of this. Here you see this conjunctival donut or some call it a balloon. The um, BSS is building up here over the cornea and you're getting distortion of view. And so thankfully in this situation, I have a really awesome assistant that is recognizing what's happening and whacking away the BSS to improve my view because we're at the very end of the case. And here you'll see when the fluid is whacked away really how different the view is. And so if this is happening during nuclear disassembly, it could be really harmful. So the solution to this is quite simple. You just do a little paracentesis at the, at the main wound and that way fluid is not directed subconjunctivally anymore. Here's a video that Dr. Tom Oding was allowing me to use, and this is a nice example of what happens when your wound is too long. So you see here they're entering a little anterior. And then as they go forward, the tunnel is a little too long. And they end up with this rather long wound that is paracentral cornea when it ends. And as they're doing nuclear disassembly and cortex removal, you see how much hydration of the cornea you get, and it really affects your view, especially when it comes to removing subincisional cortex. So if this happens to a degree, you either need to recognize it early and be quick with your case, or go ahead and make a new wound altogether. This is a quick video of a short wound. You'll see here that I am going in and I'm really entering already right there. Toe down just a little bit to enter. It looks okay, we get through the case, no big deal, but as I'm closing up here at the end, probably hydrating more than I need to because I know the wound's on the short side the iris prolapses out. And this isn't that big of a deal, but it is annoying and that patient's probably gonna have some transillumination defects right there. We were able to get the iris back in, no big deal. And then here's a common problem. And I really learned how to avoid this when I was assisting and watching other people doing their wounds. But you'll see that the surgeon's hand is tilted just enough so that the wound is asymmetric here. You can see that it's sort of a diagonal line up on the keratome and they're tilting. So a right-handed surgeon's naturally gonna supinate and tilt to the right, the opposite for a left-handed surgeon. But this causes the roof of the wound to be asymmetric. It can tear and it can cer certainly leak at the end of the case. And so here you see the wound is leaky and this wound is probably gonna need a stitch. There are several simulation platforms you can use when it comes to practicing wounds. Obviously human cadaver eyes are the best if you have access to those. Porcine or bovine eyes can be really great and model eyes are out there. This is a model eye in the background here from simulated ocular surgery. That's their cataract basic eye. And I've used this and found the cornea to be very true, especially when it comes to wounds or even suturing wounds. So we'll go next to capsulorexis tips. I learned really early that if I'm going into a case and I'm worried about it being complex or I'm worried about something going wrong, I really want to focus in and get a good capsulorexis because it can save you later. The goal is to have a centered, round, continuous rexis and about 5 to 5.5 millimeters in size, generally. I learned that in order to get the rexis you want, you want to trace the path you want it to take. So I'll show you a little video here what, what I mean by that. I'm setting the length of the rexus with the cystitome here. And then I'm going back in. And as the flap is folded over, I'm actually focusing at the tip of my utrata more than I am at the area of the tear. 
So I'm not looking so much here. I'm actually watching where this is going because I'm tracing the path that I want the rexus to take. And this works really well if you have a stable, a stable chamber and the flap is folded over properly. I'll show you that again. In this case, I normally go counterclockwise, but I was trying to learn to go clockwise. So this is the second time I've ever gone clockwise. And it still worked really well and was easy for me because I'm following the same technique I usually do. And so I'm just using my Utrata tips to trace the path I want the rexus to take. And you'll see that the tear follows where my Utratas have gone. It's really easy, I think, to get focused right at the, the crotch of the tear and then you lose sight of where your utratas are going. And then later on, when the tear catches up to the utratas, your rexus has gone somewhere you don't want it to go. This is another example that was, um, that I borrowed from Eduardo Mayorga. And this is a nice view with tripan blue, but you can see he's put a yellow circle here for you. You can see that the utrata tips are going here tracing the path you want the rexus to take, and the rexus follows nicely. Under a normal circumstance, this works very well and can be applied in pretty much any situation where you have a stable, nice chamber that's filled with OVD. The rexus should follow this path. The other tip for capsular rexus that I have is understanding and knowing the little technique to rescue a radial tear. And so we won't go into this in depth, there's a lot out there on it, but it's something I think you must know before you start to do continuous curvilinear capsular rexus. Once you understand this technique, you really understand how a rexus in an anterior capsule behaves. So it has more to it than just getting you out of a sticky situation. Simulation platform for a capsular rexus, there's lots of these. The ones that I've used the most and I find to be helpful, the IC uh, surgical simulator is great. And then also Kitaro eyes can be really great for practicing capsular rexus. The Kitaro eyes are wonderful as well because it's relatively reusable. So this pink material, you can just do rexus after rexus after rexus and you can really practice a lot in a short time. So we'll continue to move up our pyramid here. Hydrodissection, this is something I found to be challenging and I always thought it would be a simple step that I could just breathe, breeze right past. But hydrodissection is really crucial and you should avoid with all you can to go on to the next step until the lens is really spinning well. Tips for this, I would say make sure you're just under the capsular rexus edge. So when you go out with your VSS cannula, Make sure you're lifting up just a little bit to make sure you're just under the edge and you get true cortical cleaving. You want to be peripheral enough so that the BSS is directed towards the equator and doesn't just egress right back out under the rexus edge. Watch for lens vaults. So if the lens is vaulting forward, that means that BSS is stuck behind the cataract and you're going to, if you keep pushing BSS, you're risking blowing out the posterior capsule. And so after you inject, blot down a little bit to keep your cataract back. And if it won't spin, try subincisional hydrodissection. What I mean by that is here, I'll show you some graphics. You've got your nice, perfect rexus here. You're going to go in with your BSS cannula. I always go to the left first. Hydrodissect, you get your color change. Then I go to the right. And then sometimes you still have this sub-incisional attachment and you really can't spin the lens. And so what I've learned, and I wish I had known this a long time ago, is to just go in through the paracentesis and do a little sub-incisional hydrodissection. And that completes your cleavage and generally the lens spins really well. I'll show you a video of that. This is just from this week in the OR. So I'm doing my first wave here. I'm just under the rexus edge blotting down, going over here, doing the other half. Didn't get quite, quite as good of a wave. I'm trying to spin a little bit. Well, I might as well do a little hydrodelineation while I'm there. 
and I try and go back over here again, and the lens really isn't spinning great. So I go in through my paracentesis, and all it takes is just a little bit of subincisional dissection, and now the lens is spinning really well. So this is a super nice trick to get those lenses to spin. Again, avoid the temptation to go ahead and start nuclear disassembly until you've got a nice spinning lens. And we'll do one more poll question before we go on to nuclear disassembly. What type of lens is most challenging for you? Is it a soft nucleus, a dense leathery brunescent lens, a chalky white lens, intumescent lens, or is no lens challenging for you? You're just that good. Okay, so we've got about 31% that say a soft lens is challenging, 31% saying a dense leathery brunescent lens is challenging, and then 28% say intumescent white cataracts are challenging. 3% of you don't think anything is challenging. <laughs> So as you all know, there's every patient has a different type of cataract. We do our best in the pre-op evaluation in clinic to predict which kind of cataract they're going to have, how it's going to behave intra-op. But you can't always do that. One would think that the harder a lens is, the harder the case is. But obviously from the poll and what we know, it's not the case. Soft lenses can be really challenging to divide. So I like to have an approach for different lenses and a different strategy for different lenses. This is something it took me a while to learn, but now that I've got it, I think I kind of go and approach each type of lens with a certain strategy. For soft lenses, you can always aspirate the lens if it's soft enough. You can bowl the lens out and collapse it in. So bowl it out centrally, and then I use viscoelastic to collapse the, the bowl in, and then you have a nice shell of viscoelastic between the nuclear material and the posterior capsule, and it's very safe. You can also prolapse the lens. If you have a large enough rexus and a good um, hydro dissection, the lens can pop up into the iris plane or the interior chamber, and you can emulsify it there, sometimes doing sort of a soft chop in the iris plane. And along those lines, I will often do soft chop. So it requires very little phaco energy and it's more just mechanical breaking of the lens. And there are lots of great videos out there on this. But I would say of all of these, soft chop is generally what I use because the lenses are often not soft, soft enough to aspirate. They still do need some phaco emulsification. Moderate lenses, we see a lot of these. You can pretty much apply divide and conquer or any variation of chop that you're used to. I tend to either stop and chop or direct chop lenses. And then for dense lenses, you definitely should consider using a dispersive viscoelastic. Assuming you're gonna use more phaco energy, this will help coat and protect the corneal endothelium. And divide and conquer works well. You are gonna probably use a little more energy for this, but surgeons that are good at divide and conquer can really get away with less Baco energy on a denser setting. And then various um, versions of CHOP are very great for dense lenses. But if you have a really dense brunescent cataract with a leathery posterior plate, I think using my loop can be very, very useful. I'll show you a quick video of that. My loop, it, for those that aren't familiar, is a um, it's a handheld tool with this night and all loop that has flexible shape memory, and the loop is deployed, looped around the cataract, and used to snare and centripetal, centripetal forces are used to snare the lens in and essentially cut it. It is disposable and is intended to be used once. And you're using a little lever to deploy the loop. It's on the, the barrel of the device. And it has a really friendly learning curve. This is early in my surgical training, and we're using the MyLoop here to get this really dense lens into several pieces so that I can emulsify them safely. We're spinning the MyLoop here just past the midline. You'll see that gold flash. That's the back part of the, the loop. And then I'm going to pull the snare in here.
using a second instrument to keep the cataract in the bag. And there is a fair amount of bag movement, but thankfully I think the ring is moving more than the bag. It just looks like we're stressing the zonias, and we might have been, but thankfully this patient did okay. And now we've got the lens into four quadrants. And they can be pulled out of the bag and emulsified. And as you can see, this is a really dense lens with a really leathery plate. And so this would have been really challenging for me to divide and conquer or to chop. So it's a nice way to kind of stepwise approach those lenses. Some of you submitted questions about different uh, strategies for different situations. So not just learning how to approach various densities of lenses, but learning how to approach certain challenges. So we'll just go over these quickly. It would, this, each of these could be a lecture by itself, but for capsule compromise, when you're worried about this, for example, a posterior polar, some patient who's had an intravitreal injection and now they have a rapid cataract or maybe they've had a vitrectomy and a rapid cataract. The main concept is to avoid hydrodissection. If there's any compromise, hydrodissection can blow out the posterior capsule and you can drop the lens. But by avoiding hydrodissection, you're not going to be able to spin your lens. So you have to have another way of approaching the cataract. Um, without relying on spinning. For soft lenses, again, you can aspirate out the lens or bowl the lens out and collapse it, just like we've talked about. Again, you have that nice shell of viscoelastic behind the lens at this point that protects the posterior capsule. And if there is a rent in the capsule, it's already sealed off with dispersive viscoelastic. If you have a hard lens, it's a little more challenging but you can do something called a V group where you basically make a V shaped groove in the cataract and then crack it that way. Fill your cracks with dispersive viso viscoelastic as you go. So as soon as there's access to a posterior capsule rent, it's already sealed off and hopefully you can keep vitreous back. There's a lot of great videos out there on a, victory, a V groove or some people call a victory groove. But these lenses, once you have a certain set of skills to approach them, I think these cases can be really fun. For eyes that have been vitrectomized, you need to anticipate that the chamber could be hyper deep. You don't have that vitreous there to stabilize the eye like you once did. The chamber is going to be less stable. The bag is probably going to be more mobile. So in these eyes, I like to do hydrodelineation because then you have a nice cortical or uh, epinuclear shell there to keep the bag back and stable and in its more natural configuration. You want to be ready to adjust your IOP. So when you're doing cortical removal, you might want a little higher IOP to keep the bag back. And you want to consider adjusting your IOP ramp so that you're not getting these wide fluctuations in the chamber. During these cases, I would advise you to be generous with your viscoelastic. So you might need to add viscoelastic during nuclear removal. You might need to add more viscoelastic during cortical removal. Cases where there's zonular weakness. And again, these are all just broad points. But you want to minimize spinning the lens. Every time you spin the lens, you risk stressing zonules. You want to avoid chamber collapse. If there's a fair amount of vitreous, or excuse me, zonular loss, every time the chamber shallows and you get that trampolining, you risk breaking more zonules or even having vitreous come around the zonules. Chopping can be really great in these cases if you're good at it. I'd say if you're not good at chopping, using your standard technique and being very care careful to avoid stressing the zonules would be better than trying to chop if you're not good at chopping. And then considering early capsular support, whether it's hooks or rings or segments, these things can be used early on and you won't regret doing it um, later in the case. And then patients with shallow anterior chambers, I see a lot of this as a glaucoma surgeon. I would avoid overfilling these patients. The iris is just gonna pop right out and then you're dealing with the iris in the wound um, sometimes I will make my wound just slightly more anterior 
to avoid iris prolapse, but again, you don't want to make it too long or too anterior like we talked about before because then you'll compromise your view. If you do need help with pupillary dilation in these cases, I would preference um, a hook over rings. Hooks tend to take up less space and are easier to place in these smaller eyes. And then also want to consider a dispersive viscoelastic to protect the corneal endothelium. And then this is my last formal point here, but it's something that I often struggled with early on is knowing I didn't know what I didn't know and I, I didn't know when I was safe. And so when I was removing nuclear material, I just couldn't, and this is one of those situations where you wish you knew what the prime, the, what your mentors were thinking. But eventually I figured out that there are situations where the bag is more safe and where you can be more comfortable. And there are situations where you need to be on more, more on edge. So during nuclear removal, if there's a lot of epinuclear material, you're safer. The bag is pushed back and it's out of the way of the phaco needle. Similarly, when there's a hemineucleus still in the bag, the bag is kept back well, generally. Um, or when there are phaco or there are nuclear pieces in front of your phaco tip, that usually protects the bag from coming up to the phaco needle. Also, if you have a stable chamber, you're going to be safer. So if you have good wound construction, you're not pushing down on your second wound and losing a lot of fluid through your second, uh, your, excuse me, through your paracentesis, everything's going to be much safer and much more stable in those situations. The converse to that is you're less safe and the bag is more at risk when there's little or no cortical or epinuclear material. So your dense lenses or when maybe you had a lot of great hydro dissection and a lot of the cortex came out early on in the nuclear disassembly, you need to be more careful in those situations because the bag is not as protected. If you have a poor red reflex, you're not going to know how deep you are. And so you need to be more vigilant there as well. I used to think that surge didn't exist, but I learned the hard way that it still does. Um, with even with excellent FACO technology that we have now. So when you have the last few pieces you're taking out of the nucleus, especially if they're very dense and you're getting a lot of occlusion bells, you need to be very careful for a surge. It, you'll never regret pausing, adding some viscoelastic behind those last few pieces to push the bag back, um, and then taking your, your nuclear pieces out. That takes far less time than an anterior vitrectomy. If you have leaky wounds and you're noticing that, so if you have BSS or irrigation flowing fluid flying out of your paracentesis or coming around your phaco needle, maybe your wound was a little too wide for your phaco sleep, that's a less stable chamber. And so you need to keep that in mind throughout the entire case. During cortex removal, I think it's easy to tend to feel a little safer during cortex removal in general, but a, a lot of complications can come during this step. So when a lot of the cortex is still there, the bag is relatively kept back and protected, and you can be a little, you can feel a little safer. When you have a good OVD fill, so sometimes you can remove cortex under a viscoelastic, and that's a very safe, controlled way of removing cortex. And then when you have good flow, so when the bag is staying back, you're irrigating you know, your, your phaco sleeve is all the way in and your irrigation is good and your flow is good, that's a more safe situation. When you have less cortex left, you need to be more vigilant as the bag can waft up and get in the way and be snagged by your IA. Or if you have a dense posterior capsular plaque, that is an unpredictable situation in my mind, especially if the patient's had um, vitreous surgery or has silicone oil those plaques, you don't really know what the capsule is like there, the integrity of the capsule. So every now and then I will just leave the capsule alone, won't polish it. You can always explain to the patient that they might need a capsulotomy down the road. But it's better, I think, for the patient to leave that plaque there than to try and go and remove it if you don't feel comfortable. And then another thing to consider is when you're removing or going in and out with a second instrument, maybe to polish or add viscoelastic, you need to be mindful that that bag is there completely un, 
unprotected and you can pop through it. And so just to finish up, and I think this is a theme throughout today's talk, is if you think about doing something, you probably should do it. So if a retro ball bar block pops in your mind, or if you're thinking add more OBD, you probably should add more OBD. If you think, well, should I stain the anterior capsule? We didn't really talk about this, but if you think about staining the capsule, you probably should. You'll never regret it. Or if you're wondering if the pupillary dilation is going to hold out for the whole case and whether or not you should put in rings or hooks. I think especially when you're early on, just take that extra time and do it and you'll never regret that. I wanted to show you all some of the resources I used for this talk and that I used when I was learning early on. Dr. Oding has a great um, PDF blog you can find online called Cataract Surgery for Greenhorns. Dynamics by Barry Seibel is a wonderful book, lots of pictures. You really could read it probably in, you could read it in any language because it's so graphic heavy. Dr. Oding's Facebook page has hundreds of videos that are excellent and cover many of the things that I mentioned. And then Essentials of Cataract Surgery, the editor's Bonnie Henderson. I think it's a wonderful book when you're first learning FACO. Huge thanks to Dr. Oding, who essentially taught me cataract surgery. These are so many of his concepts that I reviewed today. Um, I wouldn't know what I know without him and other great teachers at the University of Iowa. Dr. Eduardo Mayorga led me, uh, lent me some of his videos and concepts, so I really appreciate that. Manjul Shaw is one of my mentors at the University of Michigan, an excellent cataract surgeon, and has taught me a lot. And Hunter Cherwick, who encouraged me to do this webinar. And so I will take questions at this time. Okay, so some of these things we went over, but I can go a little more into depth. One of the questions I received was, do you have any tips for very shallow anterior chambers? Um, and I do, I think I've learned a lot about small eyes and shallow chambers in glaucoma fellowship, obviously, patients with small eyes get a lot of glaucoma. Um, I think again, approaching the case stepwise, starting at the bottom of the pyramid and doing um, the right wound. So making sure your wound is a little more anterior so that you're not posterior and back there where the iris is gonna pop out of the wound every single time. You inject something into the eye is the first step. Making sure you have good exposure, of course. Um, if there is a small pupil or any sort of synechiae, oftentimes they'll have synechiae, posterior synechiae. I would err on the side of using hooks over a ring. Uh, my threshold is usually a 21 millimeter eye or smaller. I will opt to use hooks instead of a ring because you just get so much crowding and the ring is um, a little less predictable. Hooks are often more posterior and out of your way. And, um, and then just during nuclear disassembly or before I start nuclear disassembly on these cases, I will re-inject dispersive viscoelastic. So right before you really start your phaco emulsification, re-inject dispersive viscoelastic to protect the corneal endothelium. Um, and just taking it slower and being more mindful. A lot of times their chamber is shallow because they have zonular weakness, and so the lens is vaulted forward a little bit more. Um, so being mindful of that, looking for any signs of zonular weakness is really important. Okay, let's see. So advice for doing a continuous capsulorexis in anterior capsular fibrosis. Um, I've had a few of these situations I will often stain the capsule, so might as well improve your view. So if you get kind of confused as to whether it's fibrosis you're pulling on or capsule, having tripan or vision blue to stain the capsule so you can see it better is the first step. If you can go around it with your capsulorexis, that's what I would try to do, even if you have to make the capsulorexis a less round or a little larger. Sometimes you can actually just try and ignore it and just go right through it, just going slow, adding OVD to keep the capsule flat. 
so you don't risk radializing anything. And then I think if you want to use capsule rexus scissors to cut through that part um, or to initiate the capsule rexus in the opposite direction and kind of split the difference, um, that's a nice approach for capsular fibrosis. Sometimes leaking occurs from a paracentesis um, 20 MVR, what causes that? So I've had some leaking from my paras as well. Um, oftentimes I'm not posterior enough to the limbus. And so I think having it really make sure you're, it should be uniplanar and posterior. And I think going right in and right out, trying not to tilt or uh, slide to the side when you're going in and out um, and making sure you're posterior enough, close enough to the limbus can be helpful but sometimes they just leak. Oftentimes it's probably because you're manipulating the wound more than you realize um, with your second instrument. At least that's what I found for me. So being mindful not to distort the wound too much and then um, hydrating well in, at the end. And if you have to glue or suture, you just got to do it. And then question number five, let's see here. How do I irrigate and aspirate when I get posterior capsule rupture? Um, I generally don't use the IA tip when I have a PC tear. What I try and do is manual IA. So fill well with viscoelastic, preferably, dis preferably dispersive to tamponade back vitreous. Um, you can either, you know, you do a little anterior vitrectomy, clear out any obvious vitreous, and then when you're ready to try and remove the residual cortical material, you can do dr what we call dry IA with a, with a BSS cannula and just dry aspirate out the cortex. Um, it takes a long time and a lot of patience, but it's very safe and controlled. And then also you can use the anterior vitrector. So you would go in and aspirate, pull centrally, and then cut to... Um, pull the cortical material in. Both techniques take a long time, but the main goal is not to pull on any more vitreous or lose any more vitreous. Question eight. How to get rid of anxiety-induced hand tremors during FACO? Um, this is a really good question, a tough question. I don't know if I have a lot of great tips for it. Um, what I would do when I was first starting out is I tried to stick to the same routine every day and um, that way I enter the OR as normal as possible so if you're somebody that drinks a lot of caffeine I would just say do your normal caffeine level don't try and cut back or do more certainly um, when I was scrubbing in I would always take that moment to kind of zen and go through the steps in my head and that way you're not also thinking about what's next what's next but re and, and you can focus on what's at hand. Um, I think it's, it's really interesting. Some people are better at zoning out distractions, but I would just try and focus on the fact that it's you and the I, and that's all that matters. And, um, and try and just zone in and put off other distractions. And it, hand tremors are hard. I don't have a lot of great tips on that other than just try and go into the OR in your normal state, well-fed, you know, normal level of caffeine. That's all I have. Um, do you recommend investing time in learning extra cap in these modern FACO times? Thank you. Um, absolutely. It's something I don't know well, extra cap, and I hope to learn. But there are some situations, especially during complications, where it's really important to know how to do an extra cap. Um, and really dense lenses. And sometimes, you know, if you don't have access to a my loop or you're not great at chopping and you've got a really dense lens, it might ultimately be what's best for the patient. So I absolutely think it's an important skill and it's something that I could probably learn better from much of the world that doesn't do as much FACO. So currently, I was trained on a Cybell chopper and that's my second instrument of choice. It's nice because it's easy to spin the lens with that. I found it ergonomically nice, and it's also great for sort of a modified vertical or horizontal chop. 
I really do think that any second instrument, if you're used to it, is a good second instrument, but it's also nice to be flexible. So whatever you kind of grew up on as a second instrument, uh, that's what I would stick with if you can and if you have the option. I don't think there's really any one better second instrument than others. Along those lines, like I said, being flexible is nice because if you are in a situation where you don't have your normal second instrument, you don't want to be paralyzed by that. So during fellowship, I've used everything from a Connor wand to a bear care spatula. So you just really need to be flexible, but when you have your preferred instrument and it's available, use it. And I think that's what's safest for the patient. A Drysdale, I should also mention a Drysdale is a really nice instrument I like because it's really safe. So if I have a soft lens and I just want to spin it and it's not spinning well, a Drysdale is just this nice little spoon-like instrument that can really safely manipulate nuclear material. Okay, we have a question. Can vigorous IA be the cause of post-op corneal edema? Um, I think that's a really great question. I think we've focused a lot on phaco energy and the CDE and how that might affect corneal edema. I don't know if there's data about this. I, sh I will have to look that up, but I think more and more people are talk talking about vigorous IA and time in the, in the eye and irrigation times that can affect corneal edema. I don't have a great um, clinical correlation with that yet, but I am trying to be more efficient with my IA as well as reducing my CDE. And then, oh, we have one other question. Does FACO machine um, type make any difference for the beginner? I, um, I don't think so. I, I don't know for sure. I think I'm not an expert on FACO machines and obviously I'm young and I haven't been around very long to go through many generations of FACO machines. But I think knowing the FACO machine, understanding the settings, understanding how it works, having somebody go over it with you, I think if you know the machine well and you train on a certain machine, it probably doesn't make a difference. Um, it's just becoming used to something and becoming familiar with it and learning to operate with that certain machine. <laughs>